Well, here we are, Uncle Tom, Bob Jaskowick. We're at uh, Saint, uh, the Franciscan Wheaton facility, the uh, health facility down in the basement. We both exercise together. Um, I was interest, interesting the other day that I was sitting out there waiting for Dory to get done with her exercise program, and I met Bob, and some man came up to him and said, well, how's the atomic man doing? And I looked, and I thought, what does that mean? So after they stopped their conversation, I said, excuse me, sir, what is, what is the atomic man? What, is, what does that mean? Bob, why don't you tell me what you told me? <laughs> well, it, um, back in 1953, in I think February or March, uh, I volunteered to, to go on Yakka Flats for a, an atomic explosion, a ground explosion. And uh, we were, we were out in the desert about three weeks training and then they, they blew up a, an atomic bomb, which is the largest bomb that was ever blown up when around troops uh, at that time. And uh, I was 3,200 yards from ground zero when, uh, when a bomb went off. Um, interesting part of it is that about an hour before they blew the bomb up, uh, they told us to look out in, in a direction where the bomb's going to be blown from, and uh, they're going to they're going to fire a they're going to explode a 400-pound blockbuster, which was the largest bomb that the United States used during uh, World War II. And uh, when that when that went off, I mean, you, you could see a little flash and somewhat of a noise. But then an hour later, when they blew the atomic bomb up, that was probably the loudest noise that. Uh, I ever heard in my life. They heard, uh, they, it broke some windows in um, in Las Vegas, which is 43 miles away. Uh, they heard the noise in Salt Lake City, Utah, and they, uh, they saw the smoke in California. Yucca Flex is located in Utah though, right? Uh, Nevada. Oh, Nevada, yeah. okay. Now you said that you were in there for training. Um, what kind of training were they giving you at that time? Well, when when we went, it was strictly voluntary. I mean, they didn't they didn't make anybody go. And when we went, uh, they uh, they talked about it. Uh, it. It was really the beginning of of, of atomic warfare. Mm -hmm. What General Eisenhower, who was the president, then thought that the next war was going to be an atomic war, and this was preparing people for that. Uh, we, we trained as, uh, in the infantry we had nine-man squads at that time, and when we were out on the desert we trained in 12-man squads. And our 12, uh, 12 men were in A and B teams. We trained in uh, fire maneuver, which we never did in, with, uh, with the other way. And uh, we, we, we trained out in the desert all day long. And of course, when, by the time the palm bomb was going to be, be exploded, we were ready for it. But uh, you knew, you kind of knew what was going to happen. They told us everything. Oh, the, so they they actually launched one before, so they knew. Oh, they what they've to blown them up before. Okay, but not that large with uh, with troops. But uh, they told us everything that would happen, every all the feelings we would get out of it. My group that I was with, uh, they asked us to uh, to keep our eyes open, so they could see what the effect would be on the on the on the blast and the flash. And when the, when the flash came, it, uh, I was a squad leader at that time, and when the flash came, it closed my eyes, my eyes closed. And uh, I could see the people, the three people kneeling in front of me in the, in the squad. And when I opened my eyes, I could still see those, those people kneeling in front of me. And for about two weeks later, I still saw it before it wore off and wow. got back to normal. And my hearing was uh, very difficult for me to for me to hear after that noise. When the noise went off. And matter of fact, when I got back to my outfit, uh, my battery commander told the first sergeant to give me two three-day passes and get me out of there. So they gave me two three-day passes, and I drove home to drove home to Wisconsin, spend the week at home. How long before your hearing came back to normal? Uh, well, it, it it got back a probably a couple of weeks. Couple weeks. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, boy, that that's an exceptional story. Now, the, the, is it Yaka Flats? Yaka Flats. Yaka Flats. This is where they had the little city built. Is that the same one that I that I've seen on television, yeah. where the the same houses one. were destroyed and everything? Yeah. 
Did, were you in part of that? No, when, when I was there, they, um, uh, after, after the bomb went off, we went up and uh, we, we did a fire maneuver and crawled within 1,100 yards of ground zero. And at 1,100 yards, they had uh, uh, goats and sheep and, and uh, had goats and sheep. And then they had military weapons that were old military weapons. Uh, the goat, the sheep were the side where the flash came from. Uh, their, their fur was burnt off. And uh, the, the military weapons were, were, the machine gun with the wooden handles was, uh, was burnt off. And they told us that the goats and sheep would probably die in two or three days. Well, they didn't die immediately. No. Wow. I, there was nothing dead. Everything was alive when, that I saw it, at that point. Now later on, they, uh, I guess they built this little city that they blew up. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't there. And it was just open fields when I was there. Okay, okay. Wow, what, this is in 1953? 53. 53. Yeah, I think it was February or March of 53. Now you were, what, you were in the Army at this, at this time? And you were in World War II also. No, no. No? No, I went in, I, I went in, uh, in 1948. Okay. And I spent 20 years in the Army. Wow. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. That's wonderful. I retired a month after I was 37. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. The government has been getting sued a lot because of this, right? I don't know if they're getting sued a lot. They, well, they're they tried. They, 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 have a lot of, they have a lot of people over there that are are making claims that uh, they were exposed to radiation and everything else, and they're looking for VA benefits. And what's your take on that? I talked to a nurse earlier today, and she was surprised to find out that you were there and you're still alive. Yeah. Well, evidently, there's a there's been a lot of talk about this. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of talk about that. You know, in 19, uh, in the 1970s, there's an article in the um, Milwaukee newspaper where they were looking for they what they call atomic veterans. Anybody that was in the atomic explosion because they wanted to interview them and that they should report to the hospital or the VA or someplace, wherever. And uh, I went down, I, I went down to the VA hospital and they run me through a bunch of tests and everything else. And, and uh, they asked me if I, I had a bad leg at that time and they asked me if, uh, if my bad leg was due to the fact that I was in, in the explosion. I said, I said no and then I filled out a bunch of papers on the left of that, that. and uh, my name got to, to the Atomic Veterans Organization in, in Washington, D.C., and they would call me up on a telephone and call me up at least once a year and ask me how my, my health was and everything else. And, I mean, I never, I, never, I, I never thought that anything that happened to me was because of the atomic explosion. I, I mean, what's happening to me now? I, I feel my age, yeah, yeah. you know, and and, uh, and I look at it that way. But uh, then, too, in the '70s, there was uh, the University of Wisconsin uh, contacted me, and they came to my house in, in Racine, and uh, they interviewed me on the explosion, and they were surprised that the story I told them about my eyes being open and being so close to the explosion and everything. And they asked me if, if I thought that anything was any defect uh, because of the bomb, and I said no. However, there were two people that were also in an explosion some other time that were, that were in this tape that University of Wisconsin made. And both of them had claims out on the, from the government for uh, whatever, cancer, I don't know. But uh, you know what they, what they did is they kept track of me for I don't know, probably probably 20 years, and uh, they sent me literature where what they did is uh, I don't remember exact numbers anymore, but they figured uh, say there was 18 18,000 of us that were in this explosion. They went to a they went to a city or a town in the United States that had approximately 18,000 people in it, and they they checked both of them periodically. And at the end of 10 or 15 years, they found out that the ones that were in the explosion were healthier than the ones that were back in town and had uh, less cancer 
and everything else. And you know, in compare, and that's what they that's how they compared what uh, what was going on. And uh, of course, I I, I I thought it was an experience, and to me, it was an experience. But I never I never thought that uh, anything was wrong with me because of that. Was there anybody in your platoon? That was that was there that day that did come down with cancer that you think might have been an unnatural way of doing it. I don't know. Oh, it's, you did, never kept any touch. I with never any? kept track of anybody. Okay, all right. Boy, Bob, it's been a real pleasure meeting you, and uh, we'll have to get out there and do some laps, huh? Yeah, yeah we'll do that. Alrighty. Sergeant O'Brien, I understand you're the acting first sergeant of your company. Uh, yes, sir, that's right. How many of your men do you think would volunteer to go up and be in one of those foxholes when the bomb went off? Oh, uh, I'd volunteer, I guess, of about a half a dozen. At least half a dozen? Yes, sir. Uh, you know, that's quite a loud noise that bomb makes when it goes off. Do you think it would do you any harm? No, I don't think the noise would, sir, no. How about radiation? Do you think there's much danger from radiation? Well, radiation <laughs> is the least of the worries that the men are thinking about. I think most people thought that radiation was the greatest danger, didn't they? Where did they learn different? We were prior to our instructions here. We received a very thorough briefing before we even came in this close to contact with it. You feel that those instructions have given you confidence in your ability very much to so. very protect much. yourself? Yes, sir. How about the exercise you're going through up there? Is that uh, something you think the men will go through with all right? Yes, sir. I think they'll do very well. In it. They've been, they're mentally ready for it. They're eager, ready to go. Good. Well, we're glad to have you here. Within 30 seconds will come the thunderous roar of the explosion seven miles away. The typical mushroom-shaped cloud boils upward. atomic air bursts are from X and gamma rays, reports indicate that these are the greatest concern of the average citizen and soldier. This test in which combat troops are participating is designed to dispel much of the fear and uncertainty surrounding atomic radiation and the effects of these rays. Casualties from an atomic explosion are estimated to be in the following proportions. From blast and missile, 60%. From flash burns and heat, 30%. And from radiation, 10%. Post-blast interviews are conducted. Sergeant Gutierrez, you've seen a lot of action. Tell us what, just exactly how this thing looked to you. you. Think it's much of a weapon? I think it is, sir. Tell us about it. How did it look? Well, from my point of view, I think it's a terrific weapon, and I'd hate to be under it. Would you like to be any closer to it than you were? If I did, sir, I think I'd dig the hole a little deeper. Can you tell us uh, whether you think that the orientation you had for this weapon prepared you for what you saw out here? Yes, sir, it did. How and about then, the fear that you felt? Did they prepare you against that? Yes, sir, they did. They told us enough so that, well, our fear was cutting on so much more than it was before the orientation that we hardly had any fear at all. Would you have a was. confidence that uh, you'd be able to go right in there now and carry out your tactical mission a few yes, minutes sir. after the blast? Yes, sir. How close do you think, now that you've seen it, you'd be willing to be? Well, sir, I'll tell you that after I see them positions. Up ah, there. well, you know you dug some foxholes about yes, uh, a few miles away, and you're going to see just what uh, yes. things looked like in there. Yes, sir. What are you going to do after you look at your positions? Well, if we look at the positions, we'll pick up our weapons, and we'll move in toward ground zero. See what the area looks like in there and toward it. Did you feel uh, now, after it's all over, that you've uh, had a big letdown, that uh, there's any disappointment in this weapon? No, sir, there's no disappointment. No disappointment? It's certainly a powerful weapon. I can't understand how anything so, so beautiful can be so destructive. Radiological safety teams sent out to measure residual radiation report that the forward area is safe to enter. As they're part of the tactical exercise, the BCT and trucks to move up to its previously prepared position.
Here, the men detruck and move forward to examine their foxholes and weapons. Soon, each man will see for himself what his chances for survival would have been had he been in his foxhole at the time of the blast. In recovering their weapons from the foxholes, the men find little damage done to either the weapon or the dug-in position. Information from the radiological instruments indicate that a negligible amount of radiation exists at this position approximately two miles from ground zero. Film badges are removed from weapons and will be turned over to technical personnel for processing. The BCT receives a briefing in which the condition of equipment and emplacements is discussed. Preliminary observations indicate that a man in a foxhole caught this close to an atomic explosion would be reasonably safe. The commanding officer of the battalion combat team gives the signal for the advance toward the BCT objective, an area approximately one half mile from ground zero. In a formation of 15 columns abreast, the team moves across the desert, which only a short time before was subjected to the atomic blast. In theory, they are launching an attack against a foe which has been stunned by an atomic weapon used in close tactical support of ground troops. The radiological safety teams, with their detection instruments, have moved out ahead of the troops. The evaluators who follow shortly after will examine field fortifications and equipment for evidence of blast and heat damage as a basis for reports to be rendered by the effects evaluation group. Here, an ordnance evaluator finds a carbine-mounted snooper scope only slightly damaged, damage which can be repaired in the field. In some cases, the paint on tanks, recoilless rifles, howitzers, and other metal equipment was seared and scorched by the intense heat on the side nearest the bomb. Portions of a test bridge were damaged. Some weapons are blown over. Rubber parts and sections of tires are found to have melted. Telephone equipment sustained the blast and heat without serious damage. The evaluators and observers examine field fortifications and find them intact even at positions closest to ground zero, though heat has scorched wooden supports. Sheep below ground level in zigzag trenches show no visible sign of blast or heat effects. However, those in pens on the ground surface sustained wool burns. Blood samples are taken. A 30 caliber machine gun is checked for radiation. Other standard army field equipment and vehicles show considerable damage from heat and blast. The battalion combat team continues its march toward positions closer to ground zero. As they enter the blast area within an hour after the detonation, they realize the danger of radiation sickness from an air burst is slight. A zone pole several hundred yards from ground zero is inspected by a radiological safety man. Only slight evidence of radioactivity is found. The combat team proceeds with its tactical mission, continuing the simulated attack by passing through a portion of the bombed area. In these closer positions, the men inspect the sheep and the zigzag trenches. At one of the test positions, the men are briefed concerning damage to the various test positions which they have just seen. Later, the effects and evaluation group will prepare detailed reports on the results of the test for distribution to persons concerned with the tactical use and development of atomic weapons. Before entrucking for camp, BCT participants in the test are inspected with radiological detection instruments for evidence of radiation. A thorough head-to-foot examination will reveal any accumulation of radioactive material. Vigorous sweeping with a broom removes contaminated dust and dirt from shoes and clothing. Initial reactions are, it is possible to utilize an atomic weapon in close support of ground troops in those cases where the conditions surrounding its use are carefully considered. 
and where participating troops are fully indoctrinated in the capabilities and effects of an atomic weapon. This test, I think, went, went very well. I was quite interested in how the troops uh, reacted. I didn't find any soldier there who was afraid. They were all uh, uh, the ones who hadn't seen a bomb before, were a little apprehensive, but there was no sigh of relief when the thing went off, and no uh, great exuberance which uh, uh, comes from uh, falling being scared. In other words, as far as the soldier reaction to the thing, I would say it, they took it in their stride as American soldiers take all things of danger or uh, things that they have been told about and oriented on. The uh, troops moved out just as soon as the safety officers pronounced it safe and went out in good formation. Last I saw of them, they were pretty well up toward ground zero. Well, they, uh, the reaction of the troops in the trenches, they did exactly what they were told to do. They showed good discipline, which was good sense in this case. Any man stuck his head up, there was trouble in store for him. And they seemed to take all the discipline very well. They did indeed. And how did they move out when the order was given to move out into moved the... Moved out uh, very promptly in good formation. And they maintained tight formation. And uh, you think that this training that they have received, that you have uh, received the training that these men got there, will that be beneficial in any other time they may come across atomic attacks yes it'll be beneficial to them and also to their buddies when they go back to units so they can they can tell them about this thing we would need trained soldiers now that atomic weapons are definitely here we certainly need the trained soldiers to know what to do and to pass the word on not only to the people in the armed forces but to the civilians as well is that, that is right, correct and uh, we need uh, the soldier to understand this weapon so we can use it intelligently oh man so you were stationed in japan right my first assignment was in Japan. I spent uh, a year and a half in Japan, and Korean War broke out, and I got to go to Korea in 1950. I spent a year there, and then I came home and spent some time in the States, and I went to Germany. I spent four years in Germany, and I came back from that, and I eventually got married and went to uh, Korea again. 23 days after I got married, I, oh, left, no. I left for a year and a half in Korea. And then my last assignment, I was sent to, sent to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. I spent two years with the Ethiopian Army. Wow. That's unusual, too. I, what was going on in Ethiopia at that time? Well, they, they, they had American equipment. Okay. And the, the, our government feels that if they give American equipment to foreign countries, they to reserve the right to send people in there to make sure it's done properly. Okay. And that they don't abuse it. Wow. So now, in just a brief talking with you, you were in Berlin before the Berlin Wall went up. Yep. yep. What was it, what was the, was it tense over there at that time with the Russians? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think it was, it was t there was a lot of stories that went on about, uh, about the Russians and, and the Americans, but, uh, it was there, there was nothing tense. There was nothing that uh, kept us awake at night thinking about it. Okay. But uh, and it, it was touch and go because, uh, you know, uh, can I give you an example of one? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, when on, on guard duty in in, uh, in the western sector of Berlin, they had all four powers in a, in a building, and uh, being all four powers in a building, they had. Uh, they had four flagpoles, one for each each country: the the Russians, Americans, and the British and the the French. And uh, every morning, they'd have to roll up the flag, put the flags up, and every every evening you have to take them down. And uh, the scary part of that part of it was is that when when the, that morning or the afternoon would come, the Russians would stand in a window, and they would and they would watch and. I was starting to guard one day, and I was informed that be sure that those people do it properly. The flag goes up at the same time and comes down at the same time. And every, these young these young GIs, they they uh, when it was time to go up, they 
they'd let the flag go up, uh, the Russian flag go up lower, uh, where the other ones were up at the top. Or when they when they bring it down, they they'd bring it down real fast before it got uh, got down. And something like that happened. Uh, the the Russians would notify the American embassy, and and uh, there there would be a lot there would be heads rolling over that. But uh, I remember I had, I had that duty one time, and I. Had, Told those people that they'd never live live with me again if they'd screwed that thing up. And they did it right, so it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't bad. But I, it, I worried about it, and, and when I got ready to leave there, I was relieved of duty about uh, two weeks before I, I rotated. And I would go to regiment every day, and I'd get different. Uh, they give you different assignments, and one time I got an assignment of uh, of escorting some uh, a busload of paratroopers that were coming in and going through Berlin. And uh, on, a, on, a, on a British sector of, of Berlin was a Russian monument. And uh, they had the Russian guards marching there 24 hours a day. And uh, you couldn't take any pictures of the Russian soldiers. They wouldn't let you take, you weren't allowed to take any pictures. So the bus pulled up to that, that monument and and I told these, these paratroopers that uh, you can't take any pictures while you're up to you walk around, look around the monument, but you can't take pictures. The door opened up and they blew me out of the door. And they were uh, they were up there with their cameras standing right right in the face of the Russians taking their pictures and wow. everything else. And I got scared because I thought, you know, I, I didn't know what was gonna happen. And uh, on the other side of the, the Russian monument, was a guard house and all of a sudden the Russian guards came out and the Russian guards had, had cameras and they were taking pictures of the GI. <laughs> taking pic it's just unbelievable. They were taking pictures of the of the GIs and the next thing you know they were shaking hands and slapping <laughs> each other on the back and, and everything else. And it, it was something that you see in a story but you never really lived through anything like that. But it, it it was it was very interesting. So their guns were their cameras, basically yeah. in that little little yeah. battle there, huh? Yeah. How about that, boy? Now, do you? How long after you left Berlin did that Berlin Wall start going up? Was that around 1960? I left there in '59. Oh, okay. So it, it was it was it after was a, I left. Yeah, well, it was a bit later. Well, that's interesting. You're a piece of history, aren't you? You know, I've been to some interesting places. Well, what an interesting life you've had. And here we are in class together at the, yeah. at the hospital, and we're, we're feeling pretty good. What is, what is your take on this uh, this exercise program? How long have you been, been in the, involved in this program? Well, I'm, uh, I'm here because, uh, because I've had a heart attack, and uh, I've got a defibrillator implanted in my chest. And uh, Dr. Short, my, uh, my cardiologist, thinks that it's a good place for me to be well, yeah, three definitely. days a week. So I come here and I exercise. I, I enjoy it. I'm, my wife comes and stays with me and mm -hmm. she exercises also. It is a good facility. Yeah. So if you, you can beat it. If you want to come down here to check it out, I mean, it's a, it, it, you feel safe here because you have nurses all over oh, the place yeah. and right upstairs doctors. I belong, I belong to the YMCA before I came here and I exercised at the Y, but. Why was good, but it, it uh, you get a lot of you get a lot of help here. Yeah, so that's our little plug for the Wheaton Franciscan Hospital rehab program down here in the basement. And I uh, tell you what, this is a great place to be. I, I hope you guys could just come and check out the facility. You might really think that it would be a, a profitable place, and I think it will be a profitable yeah. place for anybody that comes here. You don't have to be a heart patient. They're open up to anyone. So, Boy, Bob, it's been a real pleasure meeting you, and uh, we'll have to get out there and do some laps, huh? Yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> Alrighty.